Hello, thank you for watching this Hatfield Museum and History Society Community Program presentation. I'm Larry Stevens, President of the Society. Since it is now Hatfield Borough's 125th anniversary, it is fitting that we present this program titled History of Hatfield Borough. If not for the North Pennsylvania Railroad Company's new rail line from Philadelphia to Bethlehem, which was completed in 1857, Hatfield Borough might never have been. It was this new rail line which cut through the open farmland of Hatfield Township that set the wheels in motion for the new borough. Back in 1848, there were very few roads and buildings in the area that would later become Hatfield Borough. The only roads were Cowpath Road, 40-foot road, which is now known as Tomlinson Avenue in the borough, a road that became known as East Vine Street, and a road connecting the Cowpath Road to the Bethlehem Pike. This connector road today includes East Broad Street, Cherry Street, Union Street, and Unionville Pike. As far as buildings, there was a hotel tavern built in 1819 at the intersection of Cowpath Road and the 40-foot road. And across the 40-foot road was Dr. Jacob Lambert's house. Dr. Lambert and his wife had just purchased this house the same year that this map was made, 1848. Up 40-foot road a bit was a blacksmith shop and up a little further was Joseph Ruth's farm, which Hatfield longtimers will remember as the Allabach farm. Across Cowpath Road from Dr. Lambert's house was Isaac Rosenberger's Inn, where Mom's water ice is now, and down at the corner of Cowpath and Vine Streets was the South Hatfield store building, a general store building which was built in 1827. And by the way, the former store building is the oldest building still standing in the borough. A short distance from the store was the small log Union Schoolhouse, shown as SH on this map here. And there were maybe two other homes in this area. So in 1848, there was a total of only nine buildings that were in the area that would eventually become Hatfield Borough. In the mid-1800s, transportation was by horse alone, but the dirt roads of the day were so bad that they would become almost impassable in wet weather, making it very difficult to get farm products to the city. So it is not surprising that news of a new train line from Philadelphia to Bethlehem right through Hatfield Township, was mostly well received. When the new railroad was built in 1857, the railroad company placed a train station where the new tracks crossed the Cowpath Road. It didn't take long after that people began to build homes and settle in the area of the new train station, drawn by its convenience to public transportation. The village that developed in this area was known as Hatfield Center. In 1873, a land speculator bought some land in an undeveloped area of Hatfield Township, just a short distance to the north of the Hatfield Station. Then, a year later, in 1874, in a rather shrewd business deal, the speculator sold two and a half acres of this land to the railroad for only one dollar, on the condition that the Hatfield Railroad Station be moved from its location at the Cowpath Road north to the new railroad property. The deal was done, the station was moved, the speculator subdivided his remaining land, and had little trouble selling the lots, at considerable profit, since they were now so convenient to the relocated train station. Soon, as shown on this 1877 map, a village grew around the relocated station, which was known as Upper Hatfield. Upper Hatfield and Lower Hatfield together 
were known as Hatfield Village. And this is an early 1900s photo of the old Hatfield train station at its new location in Upper Hatfield. This is an 1893 map of Hatfield Village. By 1896, there were about 75 homes in Hatfield Village and a good number of businesses. There was Milton Gaiman's General Store in South Hatfield and C.J. Buckley's General Store in Upper Hatfield. Dillman Culp had a grocery store, Jacob Crathamel had a clothing factory, and George Snyder had two hay presses, mills, and feed stores. There was a tin, a tin shop, Zepp's Bakery, a blacksmith shop, a wheelwright shop, and a printing business that also printed the Hatfield Invincible newspaper. There were two physicians in the village, Dr. Albright and Dr. Cope, and a public schoolhouse for the children of the village. And there were two churches in the village to give residents convenient places for worship. The Christ Brethren Church, now Bethany Bible Fellowship, and an evangelical church, now Emmanuel E.C. Church. There were also two post offices in the village, one in each of the upper and lower villages. By the end of 1897, there was some disharmony between the Hatfield Village residents and their Hatfield Township elected officials. And the cause of this discord was over street lights, like the oil lamp seen here in front of the South Hatfield Store and Post Office building at Main and Vine Street. At this time, there were only eight oil lamps in all of Hatfield Village, leaving most of the village in darkness after sundown. Residents of the village, which was essentially the commercial center of Hatfield Township, request, requested that the township install additional lamps in the villages. However, the township balked at the request, knowing that the majority of township residents, who were farmers, would not be too happy about having their tax money used for such a frivolous expense, something that they would see very little benefit from. So early in 1898, a group of about 15 men of the village held a meeting at Chester Knipes Hotel to talk about the possibility of incorporating into a borough. In that way, they would have more say in how their tax money was spent. The group then hired an attorney to start the procedure of incorporating into a borough. On June 27, 1898, a judge signed a decree incorporating the villages of Upper Hatfield and Lower Hatfield into a borough called the Borough of Hatfield. The original size of Hatfield Borough was 176 acres. And that is how the, the 1857 railroad line set the wheels in motion for the birth of the Borough of Hatfield. Hatfield Borough Council meetings were first held in Knipes Hall, behind Knipes Hotel. This is Knipes Barn as seen from Lincoln Avenue. And Knipes Hall was located on the second floor of the barn. The new council had a lot to consider in its early years. They soon approved the installation of poles and wires through the borough to bring phone service to the new town. And they worked on improving some of the key roads through the borough. This is showing houses on East Broad Street in the early 1900s. The borough purchased the two-room schoolhouse building at the corner of Main Street and Lincoln Avenue from the township, and they approved the installation of trolley tracks through the borough. The electric trolley was considered the ultimate in transportation at that time. And for borough residents, the first electric light that they ever saw was on the new electric trolley cars. The trolleys were unbelievably clean and quiet as they rolled along at amazing speeds on top of smooth tracks of steel at the side of the road. This differed greatly from the noisy, dirty, coal-fired steam engines that traveled through the borough, like this one going through the Vine Street crossing. Also, unlike the steam engines, 
the trolleys were able to negotiate very sharp curves, climb rather steep grades, and were unaffected by bad weather or even a moderately heavy snow. The original trolley tracks mostly followed already present streets and wove a rather crooked path through Hatfield Borough on its way from Lansdale to Percasey. This required the trolley to operate at a considerably slow speed through town. The biggest disaster ever in the history of the borough occurred at the Hatfield train station in 1900 over the Labor Day weekend. It was a foggy Sunday morning, September 2nd, 1900, when a packed Atlantic City bound excursion train speeding south at about 50 miles an hour crashed into the rear of a milk train stopped at the Hatfield station. At least 14 people were killed and more than 90 others were injured, maimed, and crippled for life in the terrible tragedy. In 1905, Borough Council approved the building of a bridge on East Broad Street over the Neshaminy Creek. This photo was taken just three years later in 1908, looking up East Broad Street from Market Street. In early 1908, serious talks took place between several businessmen of the community and members, members of Borough Council, and they concluded that if their new community was to progress, as other nearby communities, it would be necessary for the borough to have electricity to light its stores, places of business, and the borough's streets. The project would not be simple or inexpensive, but the, but the project did move forward and an electric substation was built on Cherry Street with a switchboard to operate the street lights. A power line was run from Satterton to the substation and on December 1st, 1908, Hatfield Borough residents enjoyed seeing the first electric street lights in their community. Four days later, on December 5th, I.C. Detweiler's store became the first borough building to be lighted with electricity. And in five more days, nearly all businesses and a number of homes were enjoying electric lights. With the borough now electrified, a number of property owners adjacent to the borough now desired to have their property become part of the borough so that they could have electricity. This was the original shape of Hatfield Borough when it was formed in 1898. But in 1910, at the request of the landowners, the borough annexed these additional adjacent lots from the township. In 1913, with the goal of eliminating the time-consuming curves on the Liberty Bell trolley line, the tracks were taken off of borough streets and relocated to create a straighter and faster route. That same year, the trolley company purchased this building from George Snyder and moved it from East Lincoln Avenue to East Broad Street to be used as the new trolley station. By 1913, a number of Hatfield residents were grumbling that they deserved to have a newer, bigger train station. After all, their small wooden station was over 55 years old. Coincidentally, one night a mysterious fire destroyed the old train station, and soon after, the railroad replaced it with this nice new modern brick station. Despite the stop, look, and listen signs posted at the borough railroad crossings, the number of accidents between trains and cars at the South Main Street crossing prompted the borough in 1914 to request that the railroad install a safety gate there. The railroad rejected the borough's request, but did agree to supply a watchman for the crossing. Two years later, in 1916, a watchman was also stationed at the Union Street crossing. This photo shows the crossing guard's shelter or watchman's box at the Union Street crossing. And of course, the society is currently restoring the Main Street watchman box at our museum. 
In 1915, the borough added another amenity, a public water system, to provide good, clean water for its residents and businesses. The borough purchased property at Main and Chestnut Street and constructed a pumping station there, as shown on this 1922 map. The information on the map indicates that the well could produce up to 85 gallons per minute. A water distribution system was also constructed throughout the borough to get the water to individual properties. This photo shows work being done to lay the borough's first water main. The house seen here on the right is 141 North Main Street near West School Street. A 90,000 gallon standpipe water storage tank was also constructed off of West Broad Street as seen on this photo. In September 1925, after 27 years of meeting in Knipes Hall, Borough Council accepted an offer from the Hatfield Fire Company to use their new station as their meeting place. In 1929, at the landowner's request, additional township property was annexed into the borough as shown on this map. In an attempt to supply cheaper and more reliable electrical service to the borough, it was decided to construct a diesel-powered electric generating plant, and on July 6, 1931, the Hatfield Borough Electric Plant was placed in operation. That's the brick electric plant there, and the smaller building behind it to the left is the borough water pump station. With plans to construct a public sewer system for the community, construction of a sewer trunk line was started in 1935. In conjunction with this, the borough annexed a small piece of land from the township where they planned to build a sewage treatment plant. Construction of the sewer system came to a screeching halt, however, due to financial shortages. By 1938, many properties were experiencing cesspool and septic tank problems. In addition, a large number of houses' sanitary sewers were connected to storm sewers, which discharged raw sewage directly into the Neshaminy Creek. And that was definitely not good. The Pennsylvania Department of Health warned the borough that this was unacceptable and ordered them to construct a sanitary sewer system and sewage treatment plant to remedy the situation. The sewer project was again revisited, but again, due to financial problems, the sewer system project was put on hold for almost 20 years. And how they got away with that is a mystery to me. To provide more water storage capacity and better water pressure to the town, in 1940, the borough built a new water tower on North Wayne Avenue on ground purchased from Bethany Church. In 1941, Select Hosiery Mills, a manufacturer of sapphire stockings, located on West Vine Street in Hatfield Township, requested that their property be annexed into the borough. The annexation of their property and the property of others on West Vine Street was approved. The end of 1941 saw the United States entering into World War II, and residents of Hatfield Borough joined the nation in the war effort with food rationing, war bond drives, victory gardens, gas stamps, fuel oil stamps, food stamps, and bans on pleasure driving. Collections were held for old silk and nylon stockings, paper, tin cans, and used cooking grease. Advertisements in the Hatfield Times newspapers reported that one teaspoon of used cooking grease could make enough gunpowder to produce five machine gun bullets. Civil defense sandboxes with shovels and buckets, like this one seen here near the borough electric plant, were placed at strategic locations throughout the town. 
These would be used to help put out fires in the event of an enemy attack. A number of Hatfield businesses also contributed to the war effort. The Hanson Textile Company manufactured knitted camouflage nets for the military. And Hopkins Equipment, located at Union Street and Maple Avenue, also assisted with the war effort. They specialized in metal plate fabrication and welding and manufactured armor plating for B-29 Super Fortresses, torpedo boats, gunships, and tanks. May 8, 1945 was VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, a big step towards bringing World War II to an end. Well aware that the war was still continuing with Japan, there was no big celebration in Hatfield Borough to mark VE Day. Instead, local businesses closed and churches were packed as residents gathered to give thanks. Three months later, on August 14, 1945, VJ Day, Victory Over Japan Day, was definitely a day of great celebration. The war was over. The Hatfield fire siren sounded for almost 10 minutes, after which the fire company started a parade around town, which grew quickly in length as it proceeded through the streets of the borough. Bells and sirens sounded for hours in celebration of the day of victory that everyone had long been looking for. In the early 1950s, a group of Hatfield Township residents approached the borough about annexing properties on Cowpath Road all the way up to Berge Road. Council conducted a survey which showed that most residents were not in favor of the annexation and the subject was dropped. Because of reduced ridership, the Liberty Bell trolley line was suddenly discontinued in September of 1951, and the trolley tracks in the borough were quickly taken up by the trolley company. There was discussion in 1954 on annexing the Hatfield Speedway and Fairgrounds property into the borough to supply it with water and electric but no action was taken. Hatfield Township was quite concerned about all this annexation talk and the possibility of losing additional land and taxes to both Hatfield and Lansdale boroughs. So in 1957, it voted to change from a second class township to a first class township, making any future borough annexations much more difficult. In fact, no additional land has been annexed from Hatfield Township since that time. The sanitary sewer system in Hatfield Borough was a long time coming. The borough had started work on constructing a system way back in 1935. Plans for the project finally moved forward in the late 1950s, and sewer lines were installed throughout the borough. By the first week of 1960, the Hatfield Borough Sewer Treatment Plant was finally placed into operation. Prior to 1961, traveling from 40 Foot Road in Hatfield Township to West Broad Street in Hatfield Borough required the negotiation of two rather sharp curves. One where 40 Foot Road changed into Talmanson Avenue and another to turn onto West Broad Street. Imagine doing that in today's traffic, especially with all the tractor trailers. In 1960, PennDOT completed construction of a new West Broad Street to eliminate the two dangerous curves. In this photo, you can see the new section of West Broad Street under construction. On January 1st, 1962, the borough began renting office space in the basement of the Hatfield Savings and Loan Association building at the corner of East Broad Street and Cherry Street. And later that year, the borough built a municipal garage off of Chestnut Street behind the electric plant for the storage of the Public Works Department vehicles. 
Prior to that, the borough used Chester Knipes Barn as their municipal storage facility. Hatfield Borough and Hatfield Township joined forces in 1965 to develop a swimming pool and park on 33 acres of land that they purchased jointly on Chestnut Street in Hatfield Township. By 1969, with the rapidly growing demand for water in the borough, additional storage capacity was needed for the borough water system. Construction of a new 750,000 gallon water tower on Roosevelt Avenue was begun, and by early 1971, the new water tower was completed and placed into service. The North Penn area experienced a very heavy rainstorm in 1971 that left many areas underwater. The Hatfield Borough Office in the basement of the Hatfield Savings and Loan did not fare well as you can see here. Not surprisingly, the borough soon began looking for new space for its office. Originally, the borough considered constructing a new municipal building on property that it owned on Edgewood Drive. But instead, they decided to renovate part of the borough public works garage into office space. By October 1972, the borough conference room renovations were completed and meetings began to be held there. With operating costs of its electric generating plant rapidly rising, Hatfield Borough stopped generating electricity in April 1977 and instead purchased all of its electricity from PPL to resell to borough customers. The borough did continue to own and maintain the electrical distribution system, and today, Hatfield Borough is one of only 35 municipal electric companies in the state of Pennsylvania. By June 1980, Suburban Cable Company had completed installation of a cable TV system in the borough, making cable TV available for the first time to borough residents. How did we survive without cable TV? Like the trolley before it, commuter train service on the Lansdale to Bethlehem branch was discontinued in July 1981 due to reduced ridership. This photo shows passengers boarding the train at the Hatfield station. The land that the borough owned on Edgewood Drive was developed in 1986 into Edgewood Park. With a playground, Edgewood Park became the borough's first active park space. In July 1987, the Chestnut Street Bridge connecting Hatfield Borough to Hatfield Township was closed to vehicular traffic because of its deteriorated condition. This photo is from 1978 when it could still support traffic, at least up to eight tons. Since 1977, drought conditions, increased demand, and a contaminated well all contributed to Hatfield Borough experiencing serious shortages in its water supply. Restrictions were placed on unnecessary water usage, such as watering lawns and washing cars. In December 1988, up against the cost of complying with the new regulations of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the borough sold its water company to the North Penn Water Authority, which continues to supply water to the borough today. In 1989, only 29 years after it was placed into operation, the Hatfield Borough Sewer Treatment Plant was abandoned and instead, the borough sewer was sent to the Hatfield Township Municipal Authority Sewer Treatment Facility for treatment. Although joining the authority meant that borough sewer rates would greatly increase, officials reported that improving the borough's sewer plant to meet the ever-increasing strict treatment standards would be even more costly. The borough did, however, continue to own and maintain the sewer system as it does today. 
In 1991, there was renewed interest in the Piedmont Expressway, a five-mile road that would connect Route 309 to the Culpsville Interchange of the PA Turnpike. The idea originated back in the 1960s, but never went anywhere. With the increased traffic through the borough, especially truck traffic, Hatfield Borough officials and neighboring municipalities expressed their support of PennDOT moving the proposed roadway forward. And now 32 years later, phase two of the three-phase project is moving along. In December of 1994, no longer in need of its storage capacity, the North Penn Water Authority dismantled the Wayne Avenue Water Tower, a borough landmark since 1940. The Christmas star, which shined brightly atop the water tower since 1948, was moved to the new water tower on Roosevelt Avenue. In October 1996, the timing mechanism that sounded the fire siren every day at noon became inoperable. And because of the expense of repairing the me mechanism and the fact that many residents seem opposed to it, the tradition of the noon siren established in 1959 came to an end. The year 1998 was a big year for Halfield Borough, its 100th anniversary. Four years earlier, a committee was established to plan how to best celebrate this great milestone. The committee also designed a new Hatfield Borough logo, which you see here. The logo featured a train and trolley because of their role in starting and growing the borough, an oil lantern lamppost to represent the conflict that led the village residents to form their own local government, and symbols for both church and family to represent the importance of family and faith in establishing a community that would be a good place to live, work, and raise a family. The year-long centennial celebration included a community centennial worship service with songs from the newly formed Centennial Choir and a centennial banquet held at Oliver's Auction Gallery where a borough history slideshow was presented and narrated by borough mayor Howard Heckler. After seven years of purchase negotiations and one year of development, a vacant parcel of land on Cherry Street behind the former Hanson building became Hatfield Borough's second active community park space. The park, which included a gazebo, a bridge over the creek, and a playground area, was dedicated on June 27, 1998 the 100th anniversary of the borough, and it was appropriately named Centennial Park. That same day, a huge Centennial Day parade was held through town, and the day ended with a large fireworks display in the new Centennial Park. The final event of the borough's Centennial Year was an old-fashioned fair and country picnic held in Centennial Park. Two years later, a lot was going on in Hatfield Borough in the year 2000. The 85-year-old pump house, built in 1915 when Hatfield Borough first started its public water system, was demolished, as was the old Hatfield Borough electric generation plant, a Hatfield landmark since 1930. In its place, a small passive park with a gazebo and water feature was developed and named Electric Plant Park to memorialize the electric plant which played such an important part in the lives of Hatfield's residents and businesses for so many years. The 25 mile Liberty Bell Trail, a bicycle and walking trail, was first proposed back in 1996 to connect Norristown to Quakertown. It was proposed to travel through 15 municipalities following as much as possible the path of the former Liberty Bell trolley route. In early 2000, Hatfield Borough became the first of these municipalities to complete work on a portion of the trail. Plans are ongoing to complete other sections of the trail. 
Quite uniquely for a small borough, Hatfield Borough still had a large 33-acre working farm up until almost the turn of the new millennia, Alabox Farm on Tomenson Avenue. Many of you, I'm sure, probably remember the Alabox Farm. For many Hatfield folks, Alabox Pond was a popular spot to enjoy fishing in the summer and ice skating in the winter. Up to the late 1990s, it was not uncommon to still hear the sound of cows drifting to the quiet night air, giving the borough a nice country feel. To make way for the development of the new Heather Meadows community, the farmland would be cleared of all buildings, including the, including the old bank barn and farmhouse. As demolition of the buildings drew close, it was discovered that the farmhouse was actually an old log house built around 1760, making it the oldest building standing in the borough at that time. In 2000, instead of being demolished, the old log farmhouse and the bank barn were carefully disassembled to make way for the new development. This is a 1993 aerial photo of the 33-acre Alabach farm. That's Tomenton Avenue running across the bottom of the picture. You can see the spring-fed Alabach pond there near the center of the photo. It was quite common for farmers to build ponds to capture and hold any ground spring water on their property to use to water their livestock. Not far from the old farmhouse was a well with an old hand water pump which for many years provided water for the families living on the farm. Jump forward several years and by around 2004 the biggest residential development in the history of the borough was completed with the construction of the Heather Meadows community which included 22 twin units and 141 townhouses. As part of the development plan, land was donated to Hatfield Borough, where a third active community park was created, Heritage Park. The park now includes a walking trail, a playground, a basketball court, and the old Alabox Pond. A small piece of Alabox farm history does still remain on the property, the old Alabox Well. There is a sidewalk that connects Heritage Park to the Heather Meadows community, and right next to the sidewalk is a landscaped area that includes a thick piece of plexiglass covering the well, and a plaque that reads, the surrounding land was part of a tract purchased from William Penn in 1705. It was farmed by five generations of the Alabach family from 1852 until 2000. This hand laid stone well is 25 feet deep and dates from the mid 1700s. It has been preserved as a historical reminder of the original settlers and following generations who lived and farmed here. So stop by and check it out sometime if you can. One of the borough's most historic structures, the former Knipes Barn Building, was mostly destroyed by fire in 2007. For those not familiar with the building, this is it located on East Broad Street near Market Street and currently home to a laundromat. Santucci's Pizza would be to the left. This is one of the oldest photos we have of Knipe's barn taken around 1900. In the days of horse travel, the barn, which was built around 1873, was used to board the horses of guests of the hotel next door. As mentioned earlier, the second floor of the barn was known as Knipes Hall, and it was a beehive of activity and rarely sat empty. Many local groups made use of the hall for their meetings, including the Borough Council meetings, the Hatfield Township School Board meetings, and many political gatherings which preceded the local elections. Both Heidelberg Church and Grace Church held their first services there. 
the township school graduation ceremonies were held there, and the Hatfield Volunteer Fire Company held its organizational meeting there in 1910. By 1922, with horses being quickly replaced by the automobile, some of the barn stable space was converted into garage space. This photo shows J. Walter Snyder's Hatfield Garage around 1930. And that's Walter Snyder there on the left. By 1927, most of the first floor of the barn had been converted into commercial space. This is the Hatfield Drug Store, which moved into the building in 1927. By the time that this photo was taken, around 1942, the American store had moved into the building next to the drug store. And many, many other businesses have occupied space in the old barn building over the years. So there is a lot of borough history connected to the old Knight barn building. The Knipes Hall space on the second floor was eventually turned into apartments. In 2007, a small fire broke out in Knipes Barn Building, but it didn't take long before the dry, 134-year-old wood building was a mass of flames. The second floor of the historic building was completely destroyed, and the first floor was heavily damaged. But thankfully, when the second floor was rebuilt, it was restored to its original look. As early as the mid-1990s, the borough had already been looking at options for a new municipal building. And by 2015, limited space and the general condition of the old, renovated public works building was getting intolerable. Plans for a new building were finalized, and in 2017, the borough offices were moved into rented space in the old George S. Snyder office building on Market Street. The old borough building was demolished to make way for the new one. A groundbreaking ceremony for the new municipal building was held in April 2018, and 16 months later, in August 2019, a ribbon-cutting ceremony was held for the new building. So that is a general overview of Hatfield Borough's 125-year history. And now I want to focus briefly on various parts of the borough's history. And the first is the borough schoolhouse. Since the borough was incorporated in 1898, its children were educated in a schoolhouse located at the corner of Main Street and Lincoln Avenue. It was originally a one-room schoolhouse but a second floor was added in 1892, making it two rooms. A year after the borough was formed, the building was expanded into a four-room school, as seen here, to accommodate the town's growing population. At that time, it was a 10-grade school. If you wanted further education, you had to go to the Lansdale High School. That changed in 1922, when Hatfield Township and Hatfield Borough got together to build this school on Cowpath Road for all children of both municipalities. And this was now a 12th grade school. That same year, 1922, the old Hatfield Borough School Building was sold and converted into apartments. In 1898, when the borough was incorporated, there was no organized fire protection. But the threat of fire caused by lightning or accidents was, of course, ever present. In March of 1910, a group of men from the community met to discuss forming a fire company for the town. And just three months later, the Hatfield Volunteer Fire Company was officially organized. At that time, however, the only firefighting equipment that they had was fire buckets and hand extinguishers. That changed later that year when the company purchased a new chemical engine. The firemen had to pull the engine by hand 
to and from a fire. For a short time, the fire company modernized its apparatus so that it could be pulled by horses, as seen here in this 1912 photo. The fire company needed some place to store their new engine, so they obtained permission from the borough to store it in the borough's electrical substation building located on Cherry Street. Incidentally, when this building was constructed in 1908, a small single jail cell was included in the back corner, making this building quite unique. In fact, it is so unique that in 2016, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's the only borough building on the register. In 1925, the Hatfield Fire Company got a home of its own when they completed construction of this firehouse on East Broad Street. Jumping ahead 40 years, it was a tragic day in July 1966 when traveling down Cowpath Road on the way to assist the Lansdale Fire Company at a major fire, Hatfield's fire truck went off the road and onto the gravel shoulder, went out of control, and rolled over, coming to rest upside down. The Hatfield Fire Company president, Francis Devlin, was killed, and eight other firemen were injured in the accident. Hatfield's Broad Street Firehouse served the fire company well for 75 years until 2000 when they moved into this new station just around the corner on Market Street. In March of 1928, after 30 years of being serviced by a constable, the borough helped, hired its first police officer, Alan Roth, to work two nights a week. But it is Chief Herbert Kreider, hired in August of 1941, that most Hatfield longtimers will remember. Chief Kreider remained in that position for 33 years until he retired from the Borough Police Department in February 1974. With the knowledge that Chief Kreider was retiring and looking to reduce expenses, the Borough began looking at the possibility of abolishing the borough police force, and instead purchased police services from Hatfield Township. Many of the borough's residents, however, were not in favor of losing its own police force, fearing a reduction in services and a loss of authority over police matters. In March 1974, borough council, while not necessarily believing that their decision was the right one, bowed to the wishes of its constituents and voted to retain its own police force. Anthony Riccardi, a former member of the Lansdale Police Department, was immediately appointed police chief of Hatfield Borough's new police force. And this is a photo of the 1974 Hatfield Borough Police Department. Long timers will recognize many of the faces there, I'm sure. Two and a half years later, though, in February of 1977, Borough Council announced its intentions to phase out the Borough Police Department due to runaway expenses. There was no major public outcry as there was previously in 1974, and the Borough entered into a contract with the Hatfield Township Police Department to provide police services for the Borough beginning on May 9, 1977 and they have been protecting and serving the borough ever since. Faith played a very big part in day-to-day -day life back when Hatfield Borough was still a vill village and in the early years of the borough, so it's no surprise that the small town had so many churches. The first church building in the village was the Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church, now known as Bethany Bible Fellowship Church. The original small church building, seen here, was constructed around 1880, and in its early days was known as Little Heaven. This photo shows a large 1955 addition to the church with the original church building to the right. 
Around 1980, when the Fellowship Hall was constructed, the original church building was incorporated into it. The church today is sometimes referred to as the Jesus Saves Church because of the pink neon sign that has been shining brightly on the front of the church for over 65 years. It's interesting to note that the only burial grounds in Hatfield Borough are located behind this church. Back in 1885, a cemetery was established behind the original church building. And in this photo from around 1915, you can see the headstones in the cemetery behind the church. In 1954, with the church looking to expand, the cemetery had to be relocated. What little remains were found were then reinterred at the edge of the church parking lot. Later, however, the parking lot was expanded and the 13-person cemetery plot, with one plaque listing those buried there, is now located in a landscaped island surrounded by blacktop. The Emmanuel Evangelical Congregational Church, built at Main Street and Lincoln Avenue in 1895, was the second church built in the village just three years before the borough was incorporated. In 1983, an educational and fellowship annex was added to the church building. Longtimers will remember the Stern House seen there on the left. The Heidelberg Reformed Church congregation began holding worship services in 1899 in Knipes Hall and dedicated its new building on East Lincoln Avenue in 1902. This photo from around 1908 is the oldest we have of the church, but it's not a great photo since the trees obscure most of the church. But by 1959, the congregation was outgrowing its building and the decision was made that instead of expanding their church, they would relocate to a 22 acre parcel on Cowpath Road in Hatfield Township. The Heidelberg United Church of Christ moved out of the borough and into their new building in 1967. Like the Reformed Church congregation, Hatfield Lutherans also held their first services in Knipes Hall in 1899. In the summer of 1905, the first services were held in the new Grace Lutheran Evangelical Church building on West Broad Street. The growing population of the area resulted in the need for more space for the church and a new addition and bell tower were dedicated in 1955. The church expanded again in 1990 with the construction of a new sanctuary behind the original church building. The old church building was renovated and used as a Christian education building. Unfortunately, a fire on New Year's Eve 2011 destroyed the original 1905 church building. The remnants of the building were cleared from the property and replaced with this new educational building in 2016. Changing gears just a little bit, let's look briefly at Hatfield Borough's oldest hotels and taverns. When the borough was incorporated in 1898, there were two hotel taverns. The oldest was the South Hatfield Hotel located at Main Street and 40 Foot Road, now known as Tomenson Avenue. The first hotel built here was a one-story building constructed way back around 1819, and they received their liquor license in 1828. The one-story hotel was torn down in 1867 and replaced with a new three-story stone building, the one seen here, to accommodate its increased patronage, no doubt, no doubt helped by the railroad being built in 1857. As you can see in this photo, the South Hatfield Hotel building contains a cupola, that square extension protruding from the roof of the building. 
it is said that this cupola was used to direct cattle being herded along the Cowpath Road and then into the fields and stockyards behind the hotel. Reportedly, the cattle were more easily driven when directed by a man standing in the cupola. I've talked a bit already about the second oldest hotel tavern in Hatfield Borough, Knipes Hotel at the corner of East Broad Street and Market Street. This three-story hotel, which was built in 1873, was originally known as the Station Hotel because of its close proximity to the relocated Hatfield train station. In 1877, the year of this map, we can see that Eli S. Delp was the owner of the hotel that year. It became known as Knipes Hotel after Chester Knipe purchased it in 1889. Mr. Knipe continued to run the hotel tavern for 71 years until his death in 1960 at the age of 99. The hotel was soon torn down to make way for a gas station. Back to the South Hatfield Hotel. The hotel building, of course, is still standing and in operation, now known as the Main Hotel. As I mentioned recently, a hotel was first built on this corner way back in 1819, and a hotel tavern business has operated on that corner ever since for over 200 years. That gives this business the distinction of being the oldest business in Hatfield Borough, and in fact, all of Hatfield. Now that doesn't mean that this is the oldest building in Hatfield Borough. You may recall that at the beginning of the program, I mentioned that the honor of being the oldest building in Hatfield Borough goes to the former South Hatfield Store Building at Main and Vine Streets, which was built in 1827. You could buy almost anything at the South Hatfield General Store. Food, furniture, hardware, oil, paint, glass, you name it, they probably had it. And if not, they could probably get it for you. For many years, as was common back then, the post office was also located in the general store building. You can see the South Hatfield post office sign hanging there from the porch roof. The most recent owner of the store was Perry Bean, who purchased the building and business in 1923 and operated it until his retirement in 1958. The building is now apartments. No talk of the borough would be complete without talking about when it was known as Turkey Town. It was in the late 1800s and early 1900s when tiny Hatfield Borough became quite famous for its huge turkey auctions. This is well-known fam famous turkey auctioneer Milton Benner, who became known as the Turkey King. Each year, about two weeks before Thanksgiving and Christmas, train car loads of turkeys, with, a, with from 800 to 1,400 turkeys per car, would be shipped north from Maryland and Virginia to be sold at auction in the borough. These turkey auctions were held at one of the borough's two hotels. This photo is from a turkey sale at the South Hatfield Hotel. Ducks, chicken, and geese were also sold at these Hatfield turkey auctions. When the sales were held at Knipes Hotel, it was standard practice for each purchaser to be given a free turkey dinner prepared by Mrs. Chester Knipe in the hotel dining room. Late 1928 saw the beginnings of the Great Depression, and it just didn't make economic sense any longer to transport the birds from the south. So the last Hatfield turkey auctions were held for the 1928 holidays, and then Hatfield's claim to fame as Turkey Town quickly faded away. For a community to thrive, it is important that it has a good financial institution, and Hatfield Borough had two of them in the early 1900s, the Hatfield Building and Loan Association and the Hatfield National Bank. 
The Building and Loan was organized in 1925 to encourage the buying and building of new homes and to provide its members with mortgages at a lower rate than could be obtained by a bank. It held its first several meetings at the George S. Snyder offices on Market Street and then relocated them into the new Hatfield Firehouse when it was completed later in 1925. The Hatfield National Bank opens, opened its doors for the first time two years later in 1927 in a rented portion of the new Hatfield Firehouse. Not long after both the building and loan and the bank were started, the United States experienced the worst economic depression in its history. During that time, many larger financial institutions did not survive. Yet the new Hatfield Building and Loan and Hatfield National Bank not only survived, but suffered no losses and grew in strength. In 1937, the Hatfield National Bank moved out of the firehouse and into their new spacious building on the corner of Main and Broad Streets. The modern building was built of brick with an Indiana limestone front and an interior beautifully finished in walnut and bronze. In 1955, the growing bank changed its name to Penn Valley National Bank and in 1966 became a branch of the Continental Bank. In 1977, the bank moved into a new building on West Broad Street in the borough and soon after, the architectural firm of Dice Road and Wolf took over the old bank building. The firm is still there 46 years later. In 1948, the Hatfield Building and Loan rented space in the rear of the Zepp home at Broad and Cherry Streets, and in 1956, they purchased the building. A year later, the association, now known as the Hatfield Savings and Loan, performed major renovations to the house and made modern, attractive offices fronting on Broad Street as you see here in this photo. In 1964, the Savings and Loan Building constructed an addition to the east end of the building, giving it almost twice as much office space. The building was expanded again when it became the North Penn Savings Association in 1974. Six years later, in 1980, North Penn Savings became Penview, Penview Savings, which operated there until it closed in 2003. Well, I would love to speak more on the borough's many wonderful businesses over the year, but that will have to wait for another program. I hope that you have enjoyed this look back at Hatfield Borough's 125-year history. Thanks for watching.